page, even your inspired word, but unless your spirit was teaching us, then uh, it would just be the thoughts and ideas of men, but we don't need that. We need your thoughts, your ideas, your truth given to us. So use your spirit through your word to point us to your son, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Humility isn't easy for, I was going to say many of us, or we should probably say it isn't easy for any of us. Uh, some of you might remember the old Mac Davis song back in 1980, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Um, none of us can claim perfection. Humility is still going to be difficult for us, though as hard as it is for us to humble ourselves, may I suggest there is something much harder to handle, not humility, but humiliation. Far better to humble yourself than to be humbled by someone else. And, of course, sometimes that someone might just be the Lord God. He desires humility from his people, especially when it comes to the reality of our sin. The Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In James 4, 6, he gladly offers grace to those who humble ourselves before him in faith, sincere faith. But he's not going to hesitate to oppose, not even going to hesitate to humiliate those who are proud. Now, this becomes glaringly apparent in Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13. Now, we know when it came to the ministry of Jeremiah, there's no doubt that he proclaimed God's judgment. The certainty of God's judgment coming on Judah and, of course, Jerusalem specifically, that's been the dominant theme of his prophecies. And it's not because there was nothing else to say. He says it so much because it was the most important thing for him to say. Because the more time that went by, the more years that went by, the closer the people got to the conquest they were going to experience from the Babylonians. Time was running short for their repentance. You might say just like it's running short for America's repentance. Humble repentance and faith. It wasn't going to change the fact of their punishment, but it would go easier on them in the day that it came if they were humble and submitted unto God. Now, most recently in the book, God called out his people regarding their rampant idolatry because they acted just like the Gentiles. They would be punished by the Gentiles and just right alongside the other Gentiles. Now, as we can imagine, that would not be a message that was uh, welcomed by too many people around him. And some from Jeremiah's hometown of Anathoth hated this message outright, and they conspired against Jeremiah to kill him. Now, of course, those were the secrets of men, but the secrets of men are not kept secret from God. They, uh, of course, their evil plans were known to God, and God promised to protect his prophet. So that was the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12 picks up precisely from that point, seemingly in the same exact context. And as before, we're going to find the message is pretty much the same. God's judgment's coming to Judah, but that didn't mean that there was nothing that the people of Judah could do about it. If they were fully convicted and finally convicted of God's righteousness and his judgment, then they still could turn to him in humble repentance. Guys, when's the best time for us to humble ourselves before the Lord? Now, right now. Each of us has the option of either humbling ourselves before the Lord or one day being humiliated in our sin. And so we want to choose grace. We want to choose to humble ourselves, appealing to the mercies of God, because God has given us such a merciful Savior. Jeremiah chapter 12, we might call the entire chapter, this is God's plan for the wicked, but he starts, Jeremiah does, with a, a personal question. Uh, we'll begin in verse 1. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? You have planted them. Yes, they have taken root. They grow. They bear fruit. You are near in their mouth, but far from their mind. Of course, Jeremiah does acknowledge God's righteousness. We'll look at that in a minute, but he still does have a question. This is a question that affected him personally. He has this conspiracy that's come against him. Apparently, they're doing well in their conspiracy, so the question is obvious. Why do the wicked prosper? It's a very common question. It's been asked throughout the centuries. It's been asked throughout the Bible. It was asked by Job in Job 21, verse 7. It was asked by the psalmist, at least in Psalm 71, verse 3, if not elsewhere. It was also asked by Habakkuk, chapter 1, when he was wondering why the wicked would prosper in the land, how long it would go on. And it comes to mind when we do look at God's righteousness. Because we know his way is perfect, we know he's perfect, so if that's the case, why does his perfect God allow wicked, sinful people to excel? So let's break down the question. 
number one, we need to affirm that God is indeed righteous. And even Jeremiah affirms that here in verse 1. There is no question that God is the just, the righteous God. He is perfect in all of his ways. Sin cannot be found in him whatsoever. Sin is found when we depart from God. It's not found in God himself. By definition, whatever God does is right. He can do no wrong. That's the first thing we acknowledge. Second thing we acknowledge is that God is sovereign. Yes, he's righteous, and in his righteousness, God sovereignly allows free will to be on this earth, and he allows a lot of things to go on in his sovereignty, even things that are rebellious acts against him. And as such, he allows wicked people to be planted and to take root and even to bear fruit, as it says here. And we would prefer it to be otherwise, but the wicked... You know, they're not always chaotic. They're not always reckless. Sometimes they're stable. Sometimes they're unwavering. Sometimes they might even grow in their power and influence, being productive in their evil works. You want proof? Just look at Washington, D.C. Doesn't take much, right? Moreover, sometimes they're found within the church and they're religious hypocrites. And they could be quick to speak of God, him being near in their mouth, as it says here, but still have no love of God in their hearts. He's far from their mind. But even so, God allows them to exist and sometimes to excel. We have to trust that God has a plan in allowing this to happen. We also have to trust that he has a plan that to, he will judge all wickedness wherever it's found in the ultimate day of his judgment. It is a difficult issue, no, no doubt about it. It is a common question. But please don't miss the fact that Jeremiah felt free to ask the question, he had grace with God, which allowed him access to plead with God. God is not afraid of our tough questions. You're not going to scare God off through your issues or even your potential doubts, and you don't want to bother trying to hide those things from the Lord. We just take those things to the Lord. We want to trust those things with him. This is part of the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. We never need to fear to take anything to the Lord in prayer. We can and we should be honest with him in all things. Jeremiah was. So he sets out this question, and in contrast to why the wicked are prospering, he points back to himself in verse 3 and, and 4, but you, O Lord, know me, you've seen me, tested my heart towards you, pull them out like sheep for the slaughter, and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn, and the herbs of every field wither, the beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there, because they said, he will not see our final end. He understands that God knows his own mind, his heart, his actions, his motives. God knew Jeremiah's sincerity. This is why it was pointless for Jeremiah to pretend any, you know, uh, piety, that he didn't have any questions, no doubts about this whole situation. God knew his heart. He might as well express it. And the prophet was angry, understandably so, that you got people out there trying to take his life. And so just like he expressed his question, he also expresses his desire for God to take vengeance on this. By the way, God knows us just as well. He knows what's true in our hearts. He knows what's false in our hearts. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. And amazingly, he still loves us. And he still pours out his grace on us in Jesus Christ. If I knew me the way God knows me, I'm not sure I would love me. But God loves me. And that's amazing. Now, as much as this affected Jeremiah, he also, uh, of course, seemed to know there was more wickedness at work than just with him. This is something that uh, God needed to address among the whole nation because it's not just Jeremiah that's mourning. It's all the land, the herbs, the animals suffer because of the wickedness in the land. It affected everything going on in the land, right? All this wickedness among the people, they did their evil with abandon because they did not fear any future judgment. That's where that statement comes in. He will not see our final end. Basically, they were thinking, we can get away with whatever we want to do. We might as well eat and drink today, for tomorrow we die, and then we become worm food. It's not going to affect us whatsoever. Just live it up. And this is why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, because without a fear of God, there is no fear of judgment. There is no thought that there might be future accountability. The sin and wickedness increases. And guys, this ought to explain so much that's going on in our own culture today, because with more and more people turning away from God and even proclaiming that God does not exist, it's no wonder that sin and wickedness is increasing in our culture today, because they've got no fear, awareness of a future judgment. So you say, well, how do we help people gain a, a fear of the Lord? Well, let me suggest a few things quickly, and we'll, we'll move on. Number one, by representing him rightly. If we talk about God in a wrong way, then there 
shouldn't have a fear of a false god. We've got to represent him rightly. Two, we need to have our own righteous fear of the Lord. We don't want to be hypocrites in this matter. But three, by presenting his word and then just letting his own word bring about conviction. Not a one of us is going to be able to debate anyone else into a right knowledge of God. What we can do is do like Andrew did and just take his brother to Jesus. We tell people of Jesus, we show them Jesus' word, and then we get out of the way and let God do what he's going to do. Now, with this question put to the Lord, prophet, of course, he needs to wait for an answer. Thankfully, we don't have to wait long here because God gives the answer starting in verse 5. And first, he's going to address Jeremiah's situation. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, then how long will you do in the floodplain of Jordan? For even your brothers, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they've called a multitude after you. Do not believe them, even though they speak smooth words to you. God acknowledges this conspiracy. Of course, that was acknowledged at the end of chapter 11 as well. But God also basically calls out Jeremiah because Jeremiah, he's saying, you don't know the half of it. You're only getting started. Now, remember at the very, very beginning of his ministry when God called Jeremiah to the ministry, God warned Jeremiah of the opposition that was going to come his way. We saw that in chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. Opposition is going to come, no doubt about it. And this is just the first foretaste of what he was going to experience later on in his ministry. These were the footmen compared with the horses he would soon face. And things would get a lot more difficult, as we're going to see in future chapters down the road. You say, well, how bad is it going to get? It's going to get downright dangerous. Describes here about the, the foot plains of the Jordan. New King James says foot plains. Other Bibles have thicket. Literally, the word refers to exaltation, which is why the King James probably translates this as swelling. We're going to find this same word later on in chapter 13, verse 9, and there they translate it as pride. But in these thickets of the foot plains surrounding the Jordan Basin River, you have this, you know, foliage come up. And in the day, mountain lions, or predatory lions at least, were known to hide. A dangerous thing to just go trampsing through the foot plains there. So this made it a sharp contrast to this, quote, land of peace, wherever Jeremiah currently was. If the conspiracy out of Anathoth was considered the land of peace, then what's coming next is really, really going to be hard. And the prophet didn't understand how easy he had it at the time. And the bottom line for Jeremiah is that God never promised him an easy ministry. What's the old song, I never promised you a rose garden? God never promised him an easy ministry. That then present day conspiracy that was revealed to Jeremiah, that's only going to be getting, there's going to be more to come. So the prophet just needed to be prepared for this tough stuff. There are going to be people out there that he could not trust. And some would approach him with smooth words and all the rest, but they wouldn't be sincere. Of course, we know time hasn't changed on that. There's a lot of people out there that come on really smooth and they use really good religious sounding words and make all kinds of promises. Be careful because they might just be treacherous. And the only way we can know the truth from that which is fiction is by comparing it to the written word of God. And that's why we always use this as our final standard. So this was Jeremiah's personal situation, but from that, God's going to address the issue with the nation starting in verse 7. I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. My heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Now, that's some harsh language. And we might ask the question, did God really forsake his people in this way? Did he really hate his people in this way? Well, he doesn't forever hate them, though it would seem like that at the time, right? Compared to the time when he's got his hand of blessing on them, when he allows the destruction of Israel, that would appear to the people as if he had totally abandoned them. God was giving his dearly beloved into the hand of their enemies due to their wickedness. They left God with no choice, and we kind of see that through the animal imagery that's listed here. you got this lion in the forest. Well, if you got a lion out there in the forest, that's an animal that's a danger. It needs to be destroyed. So likewise, God hated Israel in kind of that same way that, same way that a hunter needs to hate this dangerous animal that's out there. Additionally, he uses this picture of a, a speckled vulture or a bird of prey. Some translations render this as a hyena's den, but the context seems more specific to birds. 
But the idea of birds here brings out the uncleanness that's represented in Israel. The chosen people of God who are supposed to be holy, supposed to be sanctified. They're more like carrion birds that they couldn't even eat because they're not considered kosher. And more than Israel being like unclean birds of prey, well, it's set among these other unclean birds who are called to come and devour it, right? And this gets back to this picture we've seen before. Israel acted just like the Gentiles, so it was going to be consumed by the Gentiles. This is a declaration of their judgment. Move on in verse 10 and 11. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They've trodden my portion underfoot. They've made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They've made it desolate desolate it mourns to me the whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart now you might recall from the prophet isaiah that god very famously described israel as his own beloved vineyard isaiah chapter 5 and it was beautiful when he first made it but what had been given by god made by god cultivated by god made beautiful by god has now become a desolation how much so a desolation that word is used four times in verses 10 through 11 if you look down in verse 12, you see it there too. That's actually a different word translated the same way. It's a desolation. And we're talking more than just one city, Jerusalem, that's being desolated and, and suffered. It's the whole land. The whole place is left barren. By the way, who did it? Why did it happen? God speaks of these many rulers, which implies, of course, more than one. When we think of this destruction that's in view throughout the book of Jeremiah, normally we're going to think of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon bringing destruction to the land, but many rulers. So are there more? It could be that there's also a bit of a hint of the Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, because remember he exercised control over Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim after Josiah was killed on the battlefield. Perhaps. Perhaps the many rulers don't refer to the, uh, the Gentiles at all, however. Maybe they refer to the unfaithful kings who sat on the throne in Jerusalem. What the New King James translates as rulers, other Bible versions translate as shepherds, which normally refers to the kings and the elders of Israel. And arguably, the unfaithful kings, the shepherds in Jerusalem, did far more spiritual damage to bring that nation to, to desolation than any Gentile army ever did. By the way, we might say the same thing about things going on in our own nation. We might say the same thing about many unfaithful pastors within the evangelical church. They do more harm to the church than any attack might come from the outside. But however this desolation initially came to Israel, the land is going to be, of course, destitute. It's going to be barren. It's going to remain open for whomever to come in and plunder. And so that's where we pick up in verse 12 and 13. The plunderers have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat, but reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but do not profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Now, of course, Israel, we know that land has never been totally abandoned by the Hebrews. But there's no doubt that it's been emptied out more than once, right? It wasn't just during the 70 years of the Babylonian exile. There was also those long centuries that followed the Roman conquest, which culminated in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. The desolation that came to the land, it was indeed evidence of God's judgment. This was his sword against the people. This was God's wrath against Israel. And as a result, we know historically, we've seen the pictures, even the physical land itself became barren and fruitless, which is exactly what God said was going to happen. That was part of the curses included in Deuteronomy chapter 28. When they broke the Mosaic Covenant, the land would become barren. They, they were warned about that up front. If you go online, it's really not difficult to find pictures of the land of Israel in the past, and it does demonstrate it to be this desolate, barren place. I, I found an article uh, from Scientific American that was written in 1960, so quite a while ago now, but it described the physical change that happened to the land in just the 10 years after Israel reclaimed its homeland. And so as of 1960, they, they say this, and I want to read it to you. Quote, yet Israel was already, 10 years later, Israel was already an exporter of agricultural produce. 
nearly achieved the goal with agricultural self-sufficiency with an export-import balance in foodstuffs. It had more than doubled its cultivated land to a million acres. It had drained 44,000 acres of marshland and extended irrigation to 325,000 acres. It had increased many-fold the supply of underground water from wells and was far along on the work of diverting and utilizing the scant surface waters. On vast stretches of uncultivable land, it had established a new range cover to support a growing livestock industry and planted 37 million trees in new forest and shelter belts. That was 1960, right? In the 64 years that have taken place since that time, the growth of that land and the fruitfulness of that land has been nothing short of astounding, and it's a miraculous sign of the hand of God upon his people. I found a couple pictures for you. That's a picture from 1910, one of the first tracts of land that the Zionist movement was able to acquire to be the beginning of their homeland was in the Jezreel Valley. And it was filled with swamps, and they had to drain the swamps, and it was just a barren, barren place. Marilyn and I recently went up to the Jezreel Valley. You could look at it from the top of Mount Carmel. You want to know what it looks like today? It's beautiful. You would never know that it was so barren before. That is the hand of God. And surely that's one of the proofs that we are in the last days because the once desolate plant place of Israel is fruitful and it's vibrant. So God declared that judgment. He also does have a plan to judge those that he used for judgment. We're going to pick up here in verse 14 through 17. Thus says the Lord, against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them out of the land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be after I've plucked them out that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. Now, to this point in the chapter, God has already spoken to Jeremiah what he would do with Israel, how we would deal with Israel for their own wickedness. So now he's going to speak of the love and of the compassion that he would show upon his own people while also judging those nations that he used to judge Israel. And you're going to see that a lot through the, the, the major prophets. By the way, when he's talking here about future compassion, it proves that God wasn't ever going to forever hate his people. He promises right here there's future compassion, right? So that's the idea. But specifically, there is a prophecy of Israel's own restoration to the land. They would be brought back. They would be plucked out by God. Of course, we've seen that come true. Did it happen during the reign of Cyrus when they first came back from Babylonian captivity? Of course it did. I don't believe that's all it referred to. I do think it, it does look ahead to this modern day, uh, you know, journey of Jews from around the world to the state of Israel. And uh, I, I think we can say this prophecy has been fulfilled in more ways than one. But of course, it's going to be more than just Israel that's blessed by the compassions of the Lord. That's where we pick up in verses 16 and 17. And it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives. As they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. So he's prophesying here a time when even the Gentiles will have the opportunity to worship God. And just like they taught Israel how to sin and worship these pagan gods, Israel would teach the Gentiles, the pagans, about true worship. And of course, if they failed to cease their pagan worship, they'd be judged. You might ask, has this prophecy been fulfilled? I would say in one sense, yes, it has. And prophecy often has dual fulfillments. In one sense, this has been fulfilled because it's Israel who gave us the Messiah, after all. We who are Gentiles, we learn to worship the true God through Jesus Christ. That said, I think there's also an aspect here that looks all the way forward to the millennial kingdom because future Israel at that point is going to set the example for the nations of the world and how to worship God. And I think it'll be truly uh, ultimately fulfilled in that. All right, so that's chapter 12. A new set of prophecies is going to be given to us in chapter 13. We're going to start off with Jeremiah performing some visual parables by the Lord. This happened to several of the prophets. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hosea did the same thing. Jeremiah has certain prophetic signs to physically act out in front of the people. Sometimes pictures, you know, or, or speak louder than words, and God uses pictures with his people. We start with this idea of the linen sash. I'll read verse 1 and following. Then the Lord said to me, go and get yourself a linen sash, put it around your waist, but do not put it in water. So I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, take the sash that you acquired, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in a rock. 
So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Now it came to pass after many days that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the sash which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the sash from the place where I had hidden it, and there was the sash ruined. It was profitable for nothing. So you got this idea of the sash, this garment was to be acquired, it's to be kept perfectly clean, all up to the point where Jeremiah takes that unsoiled sash, and then he, you might say, stashes it away, and this bunch of rocks by the water. Now, by the time Jeremiah returns to it, the sash is going to be ruined. It's going to be dirty, torn, moldy between the humidity, dirt, varmints, whatever. You know, this cloth is profitable for nothing. Imagine you go out and you purchase a new shirt, and you go hide it in the woods out there past the parking lot. You go back in a few months to pick it up. What's it going to look like? It's going to look pretty nasty, no matter what you try to do to fix it up. Okay, now depending on what Bible version you read, the linen sash might be translated as linen loincloth, linen undergarment, and those translations are potentially valid. Um, I don't think we should get hung up on the, uh, you know, idea of this being priestly undergarments. I think that misses the point. You know, obviously a, a moldy loincloth would be very uncomfortable, kind of graphic, but the overall point is that however well this garment began, it's no more. Now, a key point to this parable, this symbol, this figure, is the idea that this was to be taken to the Euphrates, and most English Bibles do translate this as Euphrates, but there is a geographical difficulty we need to talk about. The Euphrates River depending on where you're starting out from, is between 350 to 400 miles away from Jerusalem. And there's no biblical indication that Jer Jeremiah ever personally traveled from Jerusalem to Babylon and back, much less did it twice as this symbol, this prophecy commands. There are two solutions usually proposed. I'll tie in a third that kind of ties in with the second, but two solutions usually proposed. Number one, Jeremiah's trip was a vision or uh, through some other supernatural means. Not unlike how Ezekiel, who was in Babylon at the time, went to Jerusalem to see the temples with all the abominations taking place in the temple. Read about that in Ezekiel chapter 8. By the way, I think it's interesting. Uh, no doubt Jeremiah was older than Ezekiel, but the two prophets were contemporary to one another. I think it would be fascinating if this is what happened, if God took Jeremiah to the Euphrates River at the same time that, you know, he took Ezekiel from Babylon to Jerusalem. It'd be kind of fun if they did it at the same time. We don't know. That's one possible solution. Second, uh, technically the word, Hebrew word translated Euphrates is parath, and some have suggested that it could refer to parah, uh, which is a town in Joshua 18, verse 23, which is a location not far from Anathoth, which was Jeremiah's hometown. And technically, the text says nothing about a river, and usually when you see Parath, it would have river alongside it, so you know it's talking about the Euphrates River. Anything we assume about water damage comes from this interpretation of the word referring to the Euphrates. So it could be going to a, a place much more closer to, to Jeremiah. And a third possibility is that uh, Jeremiah does go to Parath, Parath, um, knowing the linguistic connection with the Euphrates, knowing that people are going to uh, link this to Babylon. But the bottom line, right, the picture, you've got a garment once new, now it's worthless, it's totally ruined by time, totally ruined by the weather, what are you going to do with it? That's the question, and that's the issue behind this acted out parable. The interpretation comes in verse 8 and following, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, thus says the Lord, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So the sash is likened to the pride of Judah and Jerusalem. Now remember, this is the same word used in chapter 12 referring to the flood plain or the thicket of the Jordan. It's most literal context referring to exaltation, referring to majesty. God sees Judah and Jerusalem as being swollen with pride. Jerusalem was an especially majestic city with its palaces and with its temple. Jerusalem was the jewel of Israel. It was the heartbeat of the, of the nation. But as wonderful and as beautiful as it was, God would declare it ruined. It would be like that sash hidden by the banks of the Euphrates, stricken by abject humiliation. Goes on to describe it. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their own hearts, and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. For as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so have I caused the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Judah, to cling to me, says the Lord, that they may become my people for renown, 
for praise and for glory, but they would not hear. Following other gods while claiming to be the people of the true God was like being this ruined sash. God's desire for his people was for them to be an ornament on him, to glorify him. But tragically, that's what the people chose not to do. They left themselves ruined and they left no other option for God other than for him to cast them away, at least temporarily. So that's one picture of this ruined sash. Another picture comes with wine, starting in verse 12. Therefore, you shall speak to them this word. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And they will say to you, do we cert not certainly know that every bottle will be filled with wine? Now, that seems to be an ambiguous prophecy. Is this a word of judgment or is this a word of blessing? And the people would immediately assume the latter, that this is a word of blessing. And they scoff at the prophet. And this is the word they were constantly telling themselves. This was the thing that was often spoken to them by the false prophets among them. And their mind, they're not going to be in any danger of Babylonian conquest because they're God's chosen people. And they're always going to live in God's blessing. God would certainly bless them with material and economic prosperity. They would have an abundance of wine, an abundance of food. They'd be blessed with those things. Or would they? Because the interpretation comes in verses 13 and 14. Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of this land, even the kings who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, with drunkenness. And I will dash them against one another, even the fathers and the sons together, says the Lord. I will not pity, nor spare, nor have mercy, but will destroy them. God says, Yeah, I'm going to fill every bottle with wine, but it's going to be the wine of his judgment. And the rulers of Israel, along with the people, they'd be drunk on their own self-confidence to the point that they stand no chance against these armies that God brought against them, and they would be wiped out. Now, let's be honest. Statements that regard God's judgment often make us uncomfortable. But the latter part of verse 14 probably stands out as being really, really difficult. Because how could God, who loves us, how could God not pity his own people. Does he not love us? Does he not love them with an everlasting love? Well, yes, he does, and he explicitly will say so in chapter 31. And of course, even from the chapters we've read tonight, we know he's eventually going to show pity and compassion on his people, right? End of chapter 12, we saw that. He's going to have compassion on his people, bring them back to their land. That would be in the future. In the immediate circumstance in the immediate time frame it would feel like god had removed all pity from them he wouldn't show them any pity no mercy they would receive his judgment to the full they would drink down the cup of god's judgment to the very very dregs they would know the full measure of god's wrath now as much as we can and we should be astounded at god's work among national israel and there's many prophecies that are fulfilled there can I tell you how grateful I am and how grateful we should be that we're part of the New Testament church? Praise God that we have Jesus Christ who himself drank down the full measure of God's wrath on our behalf. We don't know the half of what we should have received. But whatever it is that we should have received, Jesus paid it all. Praise the Lord for that. So you have those two measures and two figures of judgment given at the beginning of chapter 13. Some interpret the rest of the chapter as being other figures given, but I think it's more just, if we can call prophecy regular prophecy, I think it's regular prophecy. Uh, but this is where we're getting, again, this idea of humility or humiliation, starting in verse 15. Hear and give ear. Do not be proud, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you are looking for light, he turns it to the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. But if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. So the call is clear, you know, humble yourself and hear the Lord turn to God while you've got the chance. Why? Because eventually it's going to be too late. And you say, well, it sounds like a turn or burn message. Well, guess what? That was Jeremiah's message at the time. All we can do is present God's word as it's given to us. That's what it is. If you don't weep over sin now, I assure you, you're going to weep over sin later. That was true for Israel. That's true for all people. The time to repent and turn to Jesus and ask for forgiveness is now. If we're going to wait till after death, it's going to be too late. And people get bucked up in their pride. That's why he's saying, humble yourself. 
hear, give ear, don't be proud. Too many people get proud and they let pride be the very thing that keeps them from the forgiveness and grace of God. And how foolish that is because it's right today that God offers his grace. So we don't want to waste that opportunity. We want to receive his grace and humble ourselves. Who's specifically commanded to humble themselves? Well, it's those who are in the most exalted position in the kingdom. It's the royal family. Look at verse 18 and 19. Say to the king and to the queen mother, humble yourselves, sit down, for your rule shall collapse, the crown of your glory, the cities of the south shall be shut up, and no one shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. We're talking about the king and the queen mother. When we bring that out, it's very, very possible that we get an indication from that of the general date range from elsewhere in the Bible. We know that King Jehoiachin and his mother, the queen mother, were both taken captive to Babylon along with a lot of the other Jerusalem rulers during the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 12. That took place in the year 597 B.C., roughly 10 years prior to the final fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar during the reign of Zedekiah. So perhaps this word from Jeremiah was specifically intended for Jehoiachin, who did humbly receive this word, and historically he did submit himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And that may have been the very thing that saved his life to the point that a different king of Babylon eventually releases him from prison and invites him to come have a, a seat for the rest of his life at the king's table, 2 Kings 25. It's very, very possible. Should this refer to any other king, at that point, there's no indication that the warning might have been heeded. And how ironic it would be if you've got somebody like the king of Nineveh among the Assyrians humbling himself at the preaching of Jonah, a short of a message that Jonah preached, while the kings of Judah repeatedly denied the ongoing warnings of the prophets. But before we point too many fingers, how ironic it would be that Anyone in the most Christianized nation on earth refuses to humble him or herself before Jesus Christ as Lord because we have more access to the gospel than any other nation in all history. Yet so many still refuse to turn to Jesus to be saved. Look at verse 20 through 22. Lift up your eyes and see those who come from the north. Where is the flock that will be, was given to you, your beautiful sheep? What will you say when he punishes you? For you have taught them to be chieftains, to be head over you. Will not pangs seize you like a woman in labor? And if you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? For the greatness of your iniquity, your skirts have been uncovered, your heels made bare. So to those who refuse to humble themselves, call goes out. Look at those northern invaders. Look at them coming in from the north to invade the land. What are you going to do in the day of the judgment? What's your hope when they arrive? And of course, he answers, none of course, they couldn't claim ignorance on why it was happening. They've been warned about this too many times. It all came because of their sin. And that's where we get this famous phrase from verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good to, may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. It's a famous proverb. I just can't say it tonight. <laughs> we still use that phrase today. Can the leopard change his spots? And the answer, of course, is no. Right? The skin of the Ethiopian is natural to him, just like spots are to a leper, uh, leopard, I should say, just like freckles are to myself and my daughter. You know, just natural. You can't change those aspects about ourselves. That's just part of our genetics. That's who we are. The idea is that this was the evil that was committed among the kings of Judah. It was endemic to them. It was natural to them. It was impossible for them to change because it wasn't in their nature to change. He said, well, that leaves us in kind of a hopeless state if we're just naturally going to be doing that. So we don't have any hope to change. It would leave us in a hopeless state if it wasn't for the gospel. Well, I love the good news of the gospel on that point. Do you remember what Jesus said about the impossibility of a massive camel going through the eye of a sewing needle, just as it was impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When people ask Jesus at that point, well, how then can anyone be saved? We get this wonderful answer from Jesus, Matthew 19, verse 26. Jesus looked at them and said to them, but with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. For the kings of Judah to change their proud attitude toward God, 
to change and turn away from their wicked sin, for them to do that in their own strength, by their own will, that was impossible. It would not be impossible when they're relying on God's grace and God's power. For us to change our ways and to walk in our own strength in the holiness of God is impossible. For us to be saved from God's wrath through our sin, for us to earn our way out of that, that is impossible. But God is the one who makes the impossible possible. God can empower us to act unnaturally, even when it comes to being supernaturally holy. That is his grace, that it is power that's promised to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 24 and following, Therefore I will scatter them like stubble that passes away by the wind of your wilderness. This is your lot, the portion of your measures from me, says the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Therefore I will uncover your skirts over your face, that your shame may appear. I have seen your adulteries and your lustful names, the lewdness of your harlotry, your abominations on the hills and the fields. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! Will you still not be made clean. So these final words of judgment, it seemed very, very harsh, but you got to speak some tough truths to get the attention of the people. Tough truth, they're scattering with certain. There's no escape. They're going to be dispersed among the nations of the world. They're going to be blown about like chaff blown about by the wind. That was their just punishment. They had forgotten God, so God would symbolically, at least for a time, seem to forget them by sending them among their enemies. You say, well, that, that would be pretty humiliating for them. Well, without question, it would be humility and be like a prostitute brought into the light for exposure. And their shame would be seen by everybody. God had already seen their shameful acts, all their spiritual adulteries and their abominations, so now he was going to deliver them over to the nations for them to be exposed to all the world. Humiliating. So it's, it's no wonder that God pronounced woe upon Jerusalem. Things would be terrible for them. But in all of this woeful proclamation of judgment, don't miss that final question will you still not be made clean? Isn't that amazing? After all of this, all of the declarations of God's just anger poured out on Jerusalem, their humiliation, God still offers to take this sinful, dirty, defiled, adulterous people and to cleanse them. Was it possible? How was it possible? People can't cleanse themselves. After all, they're still in the midst of their adulteries and their abominations. There's one way, and it's the only way anyone is ever going to be cleansed by God throughout the entire Bible. There's only one way anybody's cleansed, and that's by God's grace received through humble faith. At this, even this very, very late stage in Jerusalem's life, right as the nation's on the cusp of judgment, cleansing was still possible in the grace of God, but they had to go to God, responding to him in true, humble faith. And this is how all of us are to respond to the gracious offer of the Lord, humble faith in Jesus Christ. And while it's very, very possible, and perhaps for some of us, very, very probable that God is going to humble us through discipline and judgment, the invitation has gone out from him for us to humble ourselves appealing to his mercy and his grace in Jesus. This is the basic message of Jeremiah 12 and 13. God saw the acts of the wicked. He knew all those who planned to do Jeremiah harm. He saw the wickedness of his own people. They were acting like unclean birds of prey. He saw all this. He saw the sin of the rulers that made his land desolate. And he had plans to deal with all of it. Jeremiah is encouraged while his enemies are judged. Similarly, all the house of Israel is going to be judged. You see in the display of the sash and the wine spoken directly to the kings of Jerusalem, God made his determination known. He's going to judge wickedness wherever it's going to be found, even when it's found among his own people. But all is not lost in that. Men and women could still know the mercies of God when they humbled themselves to him and submitted faith. Not in the pretended insincere piety of those in the hypocrites, but a true humility, a spiritual brokenness before the Lord, knowing that the mercies of the Lord God were their only hope. There's a great picture in the Bible of what this looks like, by the way. It looks like the humble tax collector whom Jesus contrasted with the self-righteous Pharisee. Remember the Pharisee bragged in all his religious works. The tax collector understood he has zero basis for any bragging. The only hope he has is if God just shows him grace and mercy. Jesus says, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, 
saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That is the humility that God desires from us. That's the humble faith we need. When we understand the mercies of God through Jesus Christ, when we understand that is our only hope, not part of our hope, not most of our hope, our only hope, then that is a starting place of grace. Maybe you're at that starting place tonight where you need to cry out to Jesus, save me, a sinner. And if that's you, I would encourage you to do that right now as we pray. Father, you're the one speaking to the people tonight. And there may be some that you're calling to be truly saved and to have them cast themselves on your mercy and your grace. Oh, help them see Jesus in truth as the Son of God who died for them at the cross, paying the price that they deserved at the cross, rising from the grave, proving his life, proving his victory. Help them understand their need for you to be forgiven, to be saved forever. And help them cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as I cast myself on Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior forever. Help them cry out tonight. And Father, for all of us, we desire to walk in humility, willing humility. We don't, we don't want to be humbled. We don't have to be brought to that place of humiliation. We want to humble ourselves. And so, Lord, thank you for the mercies you've given us because there's many times we should have been exposed that you did not expose us. Thank you for the mercies that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he did drink down that fullness of that cup of wrath that we deserved and we know our only hope is in him so we ask you would be glorified in us tonight and the rest of this week we do ask this in jesus name amen